name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is risen. He is risen. Christos Anesti. Christos Voskres. Today, we continue the Feast of the Resurrection, and the Lord, in His kindness, and the Church, in its teaching, presents before us the story of the Lord meeting the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman at the well. Today's Gospel is filled with many layers of teaching for us to understand what it is to be a Christian and how it is to be saved from this generation. We live in a day and an age in which the heart of our salvation is threatened. The heart of our life in Christ is threatened by the relativity, the theory of there is no truth, there is no sure path to salvation, but all is relative. And the Gospel today comes as a corrective to this very destructive idea. We've all come here to Christ, we've run to Christ, we've run to His Church to be saved from this delusion. And in the Gospel today, we're going to learn what is salvation, how should we use our rational intellect for our salvation and for our life in this world, what is the spiritual life and what is the moral life? What is religion and what is revelation? What, is it, what does it mean to worship God? And who is that God? So there is much to learn. Let's begin with the part where Jesus answers the Samaritan woman. After she says, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask to drink from me a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And Jesus responds, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. And the woman responds, as we often respond to the master, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and livestock? We often respond to the Master when we cannot comprehend his will for us in our life, cannot comprehend what he is saying to us, because we have not the criteria, the spiritual criteria, which is the experience of the grace of God, which alone illumines the mind, we have not that, and so we respond many times in our life with logic, with rational intellect, with that which has been given to us for this life alone and cannot pierce the mystery of eternal life. And so like her, we respond thinking that he is speaking about worldly things, things of this world, but he's bringing us step by step if we allow him from this earth to heaven. And this is what he does here so beautifully with the woman of Samaria. And then he says to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. This is the spiritual life. This is the life of grace, the grace of the Lord. It comes in us and brings forth from us again and again, everlast to everlasting, the grace of God, the life in Christ, which surpasses understanding, which surpasses the limitations of this age. And this is what he is calling us to. And she responds, give me this water, that I may not thirst, nor come here to draw. Again, thinking in earthly terms. But she wants, she has a good disposition. And all of us, we hope, have this good disposition. We come with our ears open. That's what obedience means in Greek, ipakoi, to come under and to listen. So if we are true Christians, we are constantly listening to our spiritual father, to the providence of God, and to the words of the master, constantly listening, standing under, not opposed, not above, but standing under and waiting and listening. 
And this is absolutely necessary, otherwise the spiritual life is closed to us. So the Master is calling her to spiritual life. And then he says to her, Go call your husband and come here. And why does he say that? What does it have to do with the conversation? It has everything to do with the conversation. Because he knows, as all knowing, that the moral foundation is not there for her to obtain and understand the spiritual life. So we, understand, we see here immediately that for us to live the spiritual life, first we have to have the moral foundation. But morality and a moral life is not the spiritual life. They are very different things. One leads to the other, is essential for the other, but is not the other. It is just the foundation. If we think being a Christian is to be a good person alone, to have moral life alone, to not do bad things to others alone, we are deluded. We are in delusion, preles, plani. We are far from the path of the Christian. This is absolutely essential. But if that was all that was necessary for salvation, then our Lord did not need to come to earth and be incarnate. He gave that with the law in the Old Testament. It was sufficient for man to become a moral for this world, to prepare the ground for spiritual life. But he is calling us to so much more, such a greater calling. He's calling us from sinfulness through purification, illumination, and glorification or deification. And that is the great height that he calls us to. But it cannot be even begun if the, spirit, if the moral foundation is not laid. And so he says to her, your moral house is not in order. You have not the foundation upon which I, for, for me to build the spiritual life within you. And she answers, showing her good disposition. And we know from the history of the church, the tradition of the church, that she went on to become a great saint, Saint Fotini. She shows her good position and she says the truth. I have no husband. And he says, you have said, well, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands and the one you have now is not your husband. In that you spoke truly. This is essential for us if we want to have a spiritual life to speak truly about ourselves. Aftonosia, the Greek word for self-knowledge, is essential for theognosia, the Greek word for knowledge of God. So here she shows that she has the foundation, the good disposition that is. She has the disposition to repent. And what is repentance but return? Going from far away, like the prodigal, back to the father. And so this essential disposition, this good disposition, she has. She speaks truly about herself. She's not lie about herself. She's not cover it up. But she accuses herself. She realizes that he knows my heart. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive you are a prophet. And that meant for the Samaritans that I perceive you are the Messiah because they were waiting for the Messiah, not another prophet. And she says, Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and the you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Here we can see what religion is about. Places restricted for worship to, to, to clans or to peoples. But the gospel is universal and is given for all peoples at all times. And that is because it is the revelation of the one God. It is not man trying to ascend to heaven on his own. That is religion. And Orthodox Christianity, the church, is not a religion. It is revelation responded to with a loving heart by man and put into practice the truth of the gospel, the commandments. And so we see that here again the Lord will lead her from the earth to heaven, from religion to revelation. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. Because there is one truth, one Messiah, one gospel. It is universal for all men in all places and all times. And this is the hour that is coming and is now. You worship what you do not know. You see, many people worship, and we think that that is sufficient. But many worship things, him who they do not know. And is this worship profitable? No, it is not profitable. We must know who we worship. We must have knowledge of him. That is salvation. He says, we know what we worship, 
for salvation is of the Jews. Salvation is knowing Christ. Worshiping what we think is God is not salvation. So there are many who worship. There are many who practice religion, but they are not being saved. They do not know salvation. We must know the person of Christ, the revelation to know salvation and to experience it. The hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. What is this spirit and truth? Is it something nebulous, who is without a, without a person, without a face? No. The spirit is the Holy Spirit and the truth is Christ himself. The Lord <clears throat> said himself, I am the truth. I am the way, I am the life. All three are Christ himself. In fact, salvation is Christ himself. In fact, the church is Christ himself. St. John Chrysostom says that Christ is the church. And, and we know that salvation is Christ himself. And how do we obtain salvation? When we live in salvation, that is, in Christ. This is the key to understanding salvation. There are many who are brothers in God. It, they are, they are, rather, they are sons of God. But there are few who are sons of God in Christ. And that happens only in the mysteries of the church. <clears throat> the Father is seeking such to worship Him. The Father seeks those who want the truth to come to the truth and embrace the truth and therefore receive salvation. God is spirit and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. And what do we learn from these words of our Lord? That false dogma leads and means false worship. And false worship is not salvation. There is no relationship in false worship of a person to the person of, ma of the Master, of the Lord. There is no knowledge, and without knowledge there is no relationship, there is no salvation, there is no change and return to the Lord and communion with the Lord. The woman said, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus says, now, step by step, having led her to a greater knowledge and understanding, having opened her mind and her heart, he says plainly, in Greek, ego me." The English translation is not correct. I who speak to you am he. The Greek is, I am. And every Jew knew that that means he is saying he is God. And of course, we know in the gospel elsewhere that they said this was a blasphemy and they wanted to kill him for it. I am, egoi me. I am he who speaks to you. At this point, the disciples came, she left for the village, and she became already the great missionary, Saint Fotini. So we see here, when she goes into the city, she says, Come see. What does that remind us of? When the apostles saw the master, Nathaniel, and he went back and he said to the others, come and see. This is orthodox missionary work. Right here we see what it means to be a missionary. The missionaries go, and if they are little Christ, Christ by grace, others come who have a good disposition, see and believe, and they go and they preach, and they preach on behalf of what they've seen and what they've understood and what they've experienced. And so there is no impinging upon the freedom of others. There's no forcing anyone into anything. In the church we are free, free human beings, free in Christ. Come and see a man who told me all things that I ever did. And we all, we see in the lives of the saints the same virtue the Lord gives to his holy ones, clairvoyance, foresight. We see this in the lives of the saints all the way up into our very day. All the way up in this very age, we see that the saints have this gift. He said, everything I ever did. And only God can give this knowledge to the saints. And so she goes to the village. She preaches the Christ. They come and they believe on her witness. And then he says to the apostles, as the people from the village are coming in droves over the hill, do not say... There are still four months and then comes the harvest. 
Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes, look to the fields, for they are already white for the harvest. And St. John Chrysostom tells us that this means that he saw the people coming, and he pointed to them and said, they are ready to receive the truth. The heart has been prepared. The moral foundation is being laid. The spiritual life is coming, and they are ready to receive it. And then they begged him to stay with him, and then it was for sure that they would become followers of the Master and they would be converted. And then they said at the end, Now we believe, not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Knowledge, personal, experiential knowledge, must be for us the same as it was for them. We must have this. It is not enough simply to hear and believe. We want to have personal experience, personal confirmation in our life, in our struggle, that this is indeed the Christ. This is salvation. Salvation is to know personally, intimately, that the Christ is our Lord Jesus, that He is the Christ. And then we arrive at salvation. Worshiping a God that we do not know is not salvation. Practicing religion is not salvation. Loving the truth who is Christ, this is salvation. You've been listening to Postcards from Greece.